Ralph Waldo Emerson once quoted that, that nothing great can ever be achieved without enthusiasm. I have a lot of enthusiasm. This is Northlands in Flemington, New Jersey. Northlands is the world's largest model railroad. Well, I guess, you know, everybody has a passion for something. My thing was trains. I had trains around the Christmas tree as a kid. Wherever I lived, I'm planning uh, track plans. And then over 18 years, I added five basements onto the house. And from that, I got fairly good at making mountains and bridges and design work. And we decided to give it to the world. So we tore it all down, bought this land, built Northlands. Any given day, we run between 85 and 90 trains. Some of the details in Northlands inside, about 40,000 feet of track, about 4,000 buildings, over 400 bridges. Many of the mountains in here are three and a half stories high. Most things in here are scratch built. Underneath the entire superstructure, there's enough lumber to build about 42 large houses. It takes a few hours to go through for the average person to see everything. We went millions into debt to build this place. Everybody thought we were nuts. And the only one that believed that what I wanted to do was my wife, and she was totally with me on this, big time. It's an artistic endeavor. It's a gift to the world of what I can do, and it makes a lot of people happy. Welcome to the 1880s. This train has been running through these passes for over a century. There's no cell service up here, no gas stations, and a whole lot of mountains. It's also the highest, the longest, and one of the last authentic steam railroads left in the country. There's probably no better ride with a steam engine than this ride right here. That's Jeff Stebbins. Jeff is an engineer for this train, officially known as the Cumbers and Toltec Railway. He's been working on this railroad for the last 19 years. On this 64 miles of railroad, I have about 50,000 miles. That would translate out to around the earth about two times. Today's trains are powered by diesel and electricity, but this one keeps it old school by running on coal. We shovel about three and a half to four and a half tons of coal a day. It's dirty work, and back in the 1930s, trains began changing to diesel because it was cheaper and more efficient. The coal-powered engines were phased out. This one survived thanks to the people who cared about it and saw its beauty. This 64 miles of uh, railroading through southern Colorado, northern New Mexico, it doesn't get much more beautiful than this. The other thing about coal is that it produces all that iconic smoke coming off the train. The train takes visitors along its route in the summer and fall. People come for the history more than for the thrill of it. The train's top speed is only 20 miles an hour. I love working on the railroad and I look forward to uh, each morning that I come here. There's really uh, no place I'd rather be than the filthy, dirty locomotive. The most recognizable thing in the sky is obviously the silhouette of the Spitfire. She's just a beautiful lady. I'm sure a lot of men would actually like to marry her. But I'm sure their wives wouldn't agree. There's 396 parts in a Spitfire seat. How do I know that? I built it. This is Martin Phillips. My name is Martin Phillips, and I am sitting next to my Spitfire, RR232, which I'm the proud owner of. Martin is obsessed with Spitfires. The big bombers join in pounding the shoreline. In the darkest days of World War II, Spitfires filled the sky above England. They are an icon, like freedom on wings. British kids make models of them. But Martin took his Spitfire devotion to a whole other level. For his 40th birthday, Martin's friends gave him a single Spitfire rivet. 
When I was presented with this rivet, the challenge was to go and build myself a Spitfire. So on the spare of the moment, not thinking, I said, right, I'll go out on the Monday morning and I will build a Spitfire. I never thought that over a period of 14 years, that I'd probably wear three cars out with mileage along the journey to provide all the parts that you now see today. So fuel tanks, they came from Norway and Sweden. Some of the other parts came from Russia. Some of the parts came from Israel. Some of the other parts came from Holland, came from France. One of the wings was offered to us through a lost property department. And another wing came through a little guy coming into work. He said, I've got a Spitfire wing in my garden. The man hours that go into a project like this, don't underestimate it. They are terrific. And I know the blood, sweat and tears that went into that. After 14 years, I know the question you're going to ask me. Do you fly it? Sadly, not. I am learning to fly and I hope one day to fly it. But greater guys than me fly it. My name's Matt Jones. I'm a Spitfire pilot. The modern airliners fly at 85% the speed of sound. They got Spitfires flying at 96, 97% the speed of sound. You don't get in a Spitfire, you strap it on and it becomes a part of you. Because the aeroplane means so much to so many people, there are a lot of people who have gone down Martin's path and started thinking they want to build a Spitfire but I've never met anyone else who's completed it. He dedicated his life to finding the parts he needed to get this aeroplane flying again. I went through these 14 years, had heartache, and bits didn't fit. Just putting it together and finishing it, and the provenance, and the journey, the journey I went on, you know? Tears. Even today, I cry when it runs. It's just been amazing, absolutely amazing. At Aviation High School, we take all your regular academic classes, English, social studies, physical education, but then also we have ground operations, carburetors, magnetos, jet engines. This airplane behind me is my classroom every day. I'm Martin Shenchuk, and I'm a student at Aviation High School, and I currently go to class at JFK Airport. Aviation High School is a public New York City high school. Students at Aviation High School spend four to five years working on repairing airplanes and in the process they get their licensing to work in the industry from the Federal Aviation Administration. We have a hangar on site in our main building where we have 17 aircraft. We've been teaching students for 81 years to work in the aviation industry. We're very proud to be the school that certifies some of the most mechanics in the country. The responsibility of an aircraft mechanic is huge. I have to ensure that every single bolt, every single screw, every single piece of wire is safely secured on that aircraft, prevent anything from happening while it's in the air. When we sign off any part, it's basically our signature that's allowing the airplane to get into the sky, and our signature is worth gold. We are letting over 100 people on the ground get into the sky and get to their destination. I like working with my hands, I like getting out in the world. I love seeing the work that I put in flying there. Okay, just watch. Three, two, one. This is Thailand's Meklong Market. About an hour south of Bangkok, every day, beginning at 6.20 in the morning, a train runs through Meklong Railway Market, one of the largest produce and seafood markets in Thailand. Through the stalls selling fruit, ice cream, fish, through everything. And if you're wondering which came first, the market or the train, the answer is the market. The Meklong Railway built a commuter train to Bangkok back in 1905. The track they laid ran right through the middle of this market, which had been around for decades. Rather than moving, the vendors stayed put, adjusting their business to the train times, eight times a day, seven days a week. ไม่มีเวลาบอกก็ต้องคือต้องทําให้ปุ๊บปุ๊บปุ๊บปุ๊บภายใน3นาทีครับต้องทําให้เร็วที่สุดภายใน3นาทีคือเราค้าขายที่นี่เราจะรู้กัน
ทุกก่อน3นาทีก่อนรถไฟจะเข้าเราจะได้ยินเสียงสัญญาณก่อน3นาทีคือเก็บปลาทูขึ้นบนให้หมดแล้วถึงยกเต็นท์ขึ้นเก็บถังไอติมเข้ามาเก็บเสร็จเก็บล่มสองข้างแล้วก็ดูลูกค้าให้ยืนหลังเส้นสีสีส้ม This system has been perfected over the years. With produce just inches from the train's wheels, tourists and vendors wait as the train passes through. Then, everything goes back to normal, or at least as normal as an active train line market can be.